Hey bloggers, this is Andrew coming at you with two pieces of art today. First, we'll be looking at the Indoc portrait of King Miche. It was made in the Democratic Republic of the Congo out of wood between 1760 and 1780 CE. Before we get into the details of the statue, let's talk a little bit about the society from which it emerged. The Kuba peoples live in the southern portion of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, on the edges of the equatorial forest. At first, these peoples were separated into interconnected tribes, but over time, they formed a powerful kingdom. The Kuba people all follow the leadership of one person, the Nyim, that's spelled N-Y-I-M. Now the Kuba people made remarkable pieces across various modes. In the Kuba society, there were woodcarvers, blacksmiths, weavers, and they all worked for one person, the leader, the Nyim, like I said earlier. And just like other cultures, Kuba artists started out as apprentices and learned the craft from masters. Now they copied the master's pieces until they were skilled enough to create their own. Now, the artists' names actually weren't written down on their pieces, but the artists were very important to the court of the Kuba society. They were very important, valued members of the society. Now, the Kuba people, just like the rest of the people in sub-Saharan Africa, didn't actually write down any records. Records in Africa, written, didn't start until the area of colonialism, so around World War I. Instead, stories were told orally, and although every single story was changed every time it was told, the words, the details were changed, the spirit of the story, the main message, stayed the same. The story changed to reflect the time, but the heart of the story, the core, stayed the same. Works of art like this, the Ndop, help to freeze a moment in time. They give us an important information about not only particular leaders, but also a society as a whole. Now, this particular piece of art is a work of commemoration. Throughout history, subjects have constantly made pieces to honor their leaders or rulers. Not only can we see this pattern in history, looking at pieces that were dedicated to Charlemagne and Alexander the Great, but also in our own society. In Washington, D.C., monuments like the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, and FDR's Memorial were all made to honor our country's founding fathers. They were created to preserve their legacy and honor their memory. Now, in the early 1700s, the king of the Kuba people, Miche, that's spelled M-I-S-H-E, was beloved by all he ruled over. He was celebrated throughout his kingdom for his kindness, generosity, and benevolence. Now, at the height of his rule in 1710, he commissioned this work of art, called the Indop. Through this piece, he effectively preserved his legacy. He distinguished himself from the past kings of the Kuba peoples. Now, let's get into the details of this particular Indop statue. Now, Indop statues in general are the most identifiable form of Kuba art. The word Indop actually means statue. They're a genre of wood carvings that are meant to, to commemorate particular Kuba leaders. Now let's take a look at the form of this Kuba. Notice the rounded contours. They created forms that define the head, shoulders, stomach, and collarbone. It's very naturalistic, not at all idealized. Now, although it's considered a naturalistic piece of art, it actually wasn't created by direct observation of a particular subject. It was created using visual precedents within the, within the Kuba society. It wasn't created to represent an individual king, but instead the overall idea of a king within the Kuba society. Now, the statue is carved in one to three proportions, meaning the head is one third the size of the total figure. Notice how enlarged and elongated the actual head on the figure is. Now the head was emphasized because it was seen as the seat of intelligence, and intelligence was a highly valued idea in Kuba society. Now, each Ndop statue ever created featured a unique geometric motif and an emblem. 
This motif and emblem were chosen by the leader that it was commissioned for. Notice in the right-hand image the motif on the bottom of the statue and the emblem. Now, this is how the statues were linked to those it was meant to honor. That's the only way that we know who the statue was commissioned by. The artist's name wasn't written down, like I said earlier. Now, these patterns can be seen in other works of art from the Cuba people. It can be seen in belts, armbands, bracelets, headdresses that were commissioned for other rulers. Now, notice how the arms of the Indop extend vertically. The left hand holds a ceremonial knife and the right hand is rested on the knee. The artists of the statues actually carved particular objects that represent the prestige and power of the ruler that it was meant to honor. Now, let's move on to our second piece of art. Our second piece is the Templo Mayor, and today we'll be focusing on the main temple. It's located in Tenochtitlan, which is modern-day Mexico City, and was built by the Aztec Empire. It's made out of stone and was constructed between 1375 and 1520 CE. First, let's talk about the location of the temple. The city, Tenochtitlan, where it's located, was built in 1325 on an island in the middle of Lake Texcoco. Now, Lake Texcoco has later been filled in to accommodate Mexico City as a whole, so it's no longer there. The original structure of the Templo Mayor was built with the original city. It was built with Tenochtitlan. But it was significantly expanded over the course of the following 200 years. There were seven main building phases of the temple, and each phase corresponded to seven rulers of the Aztec Empire, and these rulers were known as speakers. Now, reconstruction and expansion often took place because of environmental problems, like flooding from the lake. Now, the main temple is located in the sacred portion of the city, the center. Now, since the city was the center of the Aztec Empire, it was at the center of the entire empire. The city was split into four different quadrants with the Templo Mayor at the center. The design, the four quadrants, references the Mexica Cosmos, which consisted of four parts centered on the nave of the universe, or the Axis Mundi. This is why that the location of the Templo Mayor is considered holy, because it symbolizes the Axis Mundi, the connection of the earth to the heavens. Now, let's take a look at the temple itself. Now, since the temple was destroyed, and we'll get to that later, there are actually no remaining pictures of it, but this is a virtual reconstruction of the temple. Now, the temple was 90 feet high, and it was composed of stucco. Two staircases, you can see them right there leading up the front, access two adjacent twin temples, each of which are dedicated to a different Aztec deity. The left temple was dedicated to Tlacloc, T-L-A-C-L-O-C. He was the deity of water and rain and was associated with agriculture and fertility. The temple on the right was dedicated to Huitzilpochti, H-U-I-Z-I-L-P-O-C-H-T-I. -I -I. He was the patron deity of Mexico and was associated with warfare, fire, and the sun. Now the pairing of these two goddesses, or gods, I'm sorry, and what they symbolized was referencing the Mexica concept of burnt water. Now this concept connotated warfare, which was the primary way in which the Aztecs acquired wealth. Now the Templo Mayor was also associated with offerings to the Aztec gods and goddesses. Hundreds of offerings and caches of offerings have been found in or around the temple. These offerings include water, coral, shells, animal skeletons, and other pieces of art. Other offer offerings indicate sacrifice, like human skull masks with obsidian tongues. The human skull indicates sacrifice, and the obsidian tongue indicates warfare. Some offerings come from faraway places, from which the Aztec royalty would collect tribute. One such piece that stands out is an Olmec mask made out of jade. Now, this mask predates the Aztec Empire, so its preservation and burial at the Templo Mayor indicate its perceived significance to the Aztec people. Now, 
let's move on to the Temple Mayor current day. Like I said earlier, it was destroyed. It was actually destroyed when it was colonized by Spain. The materials of the Temple Mayor were used to construct a chapel for the Viceroyalty of New Spain. So the temple actually isn't there anymore. The remnants of the temple, what remains of it, is buried, so you can't see it. But tourists can walk through the excavation site. However, they can only walk through on platforms. Now notice how the temple is actually built in the center of Mexico City. You can see people in the background. You can see the main plaza. Just remember that the temple was very central to the empire and was very important to the Aztec peoples. All right, that does it for me. Make sure to like and subscribe this video. Thanks.